obviously with the baby's age as well. So what um, is normal activity, tone, um, feeding, those kind of things, obviously from a newborn to even a two, four month old is very, very different. So things change, but you guys are the experts in your babies essentially. So, and also I don't think you know, anybody expects a parent to be the medical expert either. So if you're saying, you know, they're more unsettled than usual, I can't settle them, you know, putting them to breast or using the dummy or all, all our tools in our kit are not working. Are you smiling, Tobias? Um, so, yeah, as I say, just back yourself, I think, is the main thing. So things we're looking for in an unwell baby is their, obviously their main activity at the moment is, is uh, the little ones, and will be, um, will uh, uh, eating is their main task, I guess. So that is definitely something that people will always, always, always ask you about and always be concerned about. So if they're not feeding as they are used, you're used to them feeding, that would be um, of concern. And with that, if they're not feeding uh, as well as usual, obviously, then their output. So people ask you about their wet and dirty nappies. People often ask numbers and surprisingly, you'll know no doubt, you'll probably know how many wet and dirty nappies they have a day or how, you know, when their last poo was or, you know, all those normal things that you don't think that you will know, you will without even knowing it, you know what I mean? Without, it, it'll just be a kind of subconscious thing that you'll know. So obviously if we're not having um, adequate input, we're not, our output is not gonna be adequate. And then certainly in the early days, a bit different for these older babies here, but certainly in the early days, that um, can be quite significant, as you can imagine, in, in weight loss particularly. As you mostly know, probably, that they have, you know, they do have a dip straight after birth and then hopefully have regained their birth weight about seven to 10 days of life. But, um, and, you know, ongoing checks and things are, you know, we obviously do the manual plots in the red book, but again, you will know. So the way we know a baby's getting enough milk, for example, is they're settled between feeds, they're growing out of their clothes, so without even worrying about scales and numbers and all those kind of things. So settled between feeds, lots of wet and dirty nappies growing out of our clothes. We know we're doing a pretty good job. Um, so going back to, the, so decreased input might be for a, a host of reasons. So real alarm bells go off in an unsettled baby that is inconsolable. So that irritable, um, potentially a high-pitched scream, um, you know, just not settling. Obviously that happens sometimes, you know, but the idea is that it, it can't, they, they just can't be settled. And on the flip side of that, so therefore they're not going to feed properly, but on the flip side of that, that whole, um, the other side of that is the lethargy, as in ragdoll, can't wake them, un, almost unrousable, obviously is a massive alarm bell. So I'll just put in at this point, so I, if I forget to say it again, ring an ambulance. Nobody, everybody would rather turn up to a house where they've been, you know, an ambulance officer would be called, turn up to a house and the baby's now fine, then not called at all. Because often we, you know, sometimes we hear stories like people have presented through emergency or, oh, I just kind of, I didn't want to bother anybody. It's been kind of, I'll be worried for a few days. Just get it done, you know, just um, ring because it's better to be, especially in babies, it's better to be overcautious and under, you know, uh, under cautious, you really, is um, so, and certainly in an emergency, so a lethargic or irritable baby that can't be consoled, um, fever is a big red flag in a baby as well. So fever would be up over 38, from 38. Um, and sometimes, you know, somebody said to me once, you're gonna think about temperature more than you ever thought possible when you're caring for your children. And I still, now with my six and eight year old, still worry about how warm or cold they are at night. So sometimes we do overcook them, because I've done it myself, you know, we're worried about them being cold. So if, you know, if you've got a 38 temperature and then you've taken the three blankets that you've put on them off and, and it's kind of come down normalized, so that would be an environmental temperature. But a true fever, 
um, is alarming, especially in babies under three months. So that would be a definite phone call to an ambulance as well, I would say. Um, what else? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes, I would. As, yeah. If so, the idea is also a, a true fever is one that is not brought down by paracetamol. There is obviously Nurofen. You've probably heard as well. They are, you know, the manufacturer recommendations on the side of the box. If you look at the side of the box, I think it's under one month. It says not to give it. Does anybody remember that? Um, you know, we. In the hospital, we give it under one month. Not that I, I think, to be honest, I think if you were thinking about giving paracetamol in an under one month old baby, you'd be going to see someone anyway. I think because it's unusual for a baby under one month to need paracetamol. Um, so that's probably why another reason why the recommendations are because it is actually safe. We do give it in the hospital. And obviously there's those guidelines on the side about weight, um, you know, the dosages are really conservative. They're even less than we would give in the hospital really. So um, not that I'm advocating giving over those doses, but do, you know, just don't be um, too concerned about that. Um, so there's obviously, you know, there's lots of illness going around at the moment, being winter, and certainly with older children, they're almost saying stay at home because, you know, if it's viral, as we know, if it's viral, generally speaking, they're not treated with antibiotics, but little babies, they would be more conservative. And if you fronted up to emergency department and you had an unwell baby, the likelihood is that they will be recommending antibiotics for that baby because that we just don't, you know, sepsis and infection is really high on the list of concerns for um, newborn babies. So don't be surprised about that, essentially. Hopefully not, hopefully not. And certainly with a history of, you know, uh, toddler sibling who's been to childcare and has come home snotty and now the baby's snotty. It's pretty, um, you know, an obvious pathway generally, which is very common. Um, so potentially not, but as I say, I think some of you are past the three months, some not even started yet. Um, but three months is a bit, um, not that we're not concerned, but you know, under three months is of high concern, I would say. So things to look at, just going back to the signs and symptoms of an unwell newborn. So overall, we always look at, and even if you're not using the terms I'm using in your head, you would know what's normal colour, what's normal tone, so the way they're holding themselves. Um, you would know normal activity. So all these um, what seem like uncoordinated writhing movements is normal neurodevelopmental um, behaviour of a baby. So you, you are not thinking that, but I'm thinking that when I'm looking at babies. Um, but you, what you would notice is, yeah, they haven't, they're not waking for their feeds potentially, not interested in feeds. Just being irritable would be one. A big alarm bell, I guess, for us is babies obviously can't tell us what's wrong with them and their signs and symptoms are really non-specific. So that they all, they could, you know, there's a big variety and a, uh, I guess a wide severity of um, how they would present. But even if it might be different causes, they kind of present the same. And a big one would be the way they're breathing, obviously. And that would, um, you know, we need to breathe, obviously, and we need to breathe well. So um, things you would notice in your baby. So signs of respiratory distress would be sucking under their ribs, which you, which is, especially in little babies, it's kind of hard, well, it's probably easier to see actually because they have big fat bellies, which is normal. Um, but sucking in under the ribs, a true sucking in under the ribs, sometimes you can see what we call intercostal recession. So sucking in through their ribs as well. Sometimes they, what is called a tracheal tug. So they're sucking in here some nasal flaring, um, sometimes a head bob. So when they're gasping for air, they'll almost be moving their whole body in a bob and obviously fast, so faster than usual. Babies breathe about 40 to 60 times in a minute, which is normal, but anything faster than that ongoing is a concern. 
For little babies, you'll notice we get asked about all the time about what we call periodic breathing. So they seem to go fast, 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 which sometimes alarms people, but then almost like a pause to slow, or like almost what seems like they're stopping breathing, but it's that's normal. Once they um, their respiratory centres mature a bit, they'll just regulate. They don't, they just don't breathe like we do. You know that usual regular breaths. So that's normal. So it just so when a baby's breathing is alarming is when it appears laboured, like it's really hard work for them, like they're almost you know gasping for air. Mm. Yes. Um, Wait a minute. <laughs> so, um, when a baby's got a bit of a cough, yeah. like, and you can hear that on the machine, like, mm. are you better to, or it, it might be situational, but are you better to leave them lying down in their flat lying position or raise them up to give gravity? It's tricky, yeah, good I'm one. Finding that really tricky. Yeah. To know what position we know to babies do. breathe better on their tummies and obviously that's everything against our safe sleeping guidelines but if you and and in an upright position so if it were me and I had a sick baby on you know that I knew was fine but just not very well yeah caught the snuffles from whoever else um, it, a good position would be you being in a reclining position with them chest to chest so they're upright because as we know like you know when we've had a cough or we've got asthma or whatever you know people prop adults prop themselves up on pillows in bed so you're right because as we all know if you've got a cough and you you, you know it's worse in the morning when we've been lying down all night it is the same thing and if it's a true cough and it's productive and it's coming from their chest um, certainly upright is better but it's obviously just your capacity to facilitate that so, and, and as we all know, the safe sleeping guidelines is that any, anything propped, you know, even towels under a mattress is just so they're not, whilst they're little, little, they're not slumping down under their bedding, essentially. So, you know, safe sleeping guidelines are about them being clearing, keeping their airways clear as much as possible to reduce that risk. Obviously, when they're a bit bigger and they're, you know, rolling and potentially turning themselves prone anyway to sleep. There's nothing you can do about that because they're big enough to be able to, to move their airways. <clears throat> a question I get asked all the time is about that weird snuffly sounds, the grunting and groaning that they make, seem to make all the time. And pure, it's mostly because, and then, I'll, and then I'll actually have a listen to a chest with the stethoscope and it's not on the chest it just sounds like it is and and what I can sometimes hear is what is like transmitted sound so it's all here which most of the time even in a cold but even on a good day you know some babies can sound really noisy and you're like are you asleep are you hungry are you pooing like what's actually going on um what it is is they've just got such narrow airways and obviously our airways are moist, That's, it's our filter into our body, so they're meant to be moist. Um, so any sort of kind of vague obstruction, sometimes spilly babies, babies who are, um, you know, just those ones that posit milk all the time, any sort of obstruction through that tiny airway just creates such a loud noise, but that is all it is. So in the absence of how I describe those um, increased worker breathing signs and symptoms, like really laboured looking, we just, have to try and roll over and go back to sleep, they're fine. Does that help? Yeah. Sometimes it sounds like that it's just in the back of their throat as well and there's nothing really you can do. Yeah, being prone because it might be... No, that's right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, being prone, you'd have a bit of kind of gravity drainage kind of thing. So, if yeah, if depending on who and size, you, you know, I guess the safest point would be if you were trying to get them to have a sleep yeah on your chest a bit different like this size yeah yeah you're little yeah 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 so the answer is yes just do it safely <laughs> yeah. anybody have anything yeah oh good what what was 
Yeah. Just sit down. Yeah, you're just not getting any sleep because you're wondering what that noise is. <laughs> a day, okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the colder weather, I think everyone's feeling it a bit because everyone's, you know, just a bit more mucusy, even in the cold air and things. Yeah. Yeah. So without, um, <laughs> without the other signs of worker breathing, no, just ride it out. Yeah. The yeah. And then the fevers and the work of breathing. Perfect. The high work of breathing. Yeah, yeah. Four main ones that yeah. okay. they're really good things. And like you don't necessarily need all four to like call an no. ambulance or anything, no. especially before that three month yeah. mark. No. I think if you're concerned, as I say, people would um, not that anybody's gonna be critical about anything, but um, you know, I think you're just more, you're just better off, even for a, your own peace of mind, just to get them checked out. Yep. I agree. And any time I've been in the hospital and mamas have brought their babies in and they're, and they're always, as you said, like, oh, I'm so sorry to waste your time. I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. And we are never, ever, ever, you know, oh, like, why did you come in? That was so mm. traumatic. It's never, ever like mm. that. So there's, yeah, there needs to be no hesitation from that part. Mm. Mm. Just to be concerned about induction. Mm. Uh, I've got a naturally stewy baby. Yep. Um, so is there a point that we should be concerned, I guess, because of the blood? Oh. Uh, concern would be red and green. Okay. <clears throat> so blood or bile at any time, because that can obviously, you know, can happen any time in babies. And um, what we're worried about then especially in an older baby, would be some sort of obstruction for a host of reasons that can happen. <coughs> Hopefully never. <coughs> but in, a, you know, all these well babies, as you say, and a normally spewy baby, it's just frustrating when it's breast milk. Um, but in the absence... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, I gave you that. Um, uh, in a well-growing, you know, normal development baby no no some are just more spilly than others for whatever reason they're basically they're you know the distance between here and their gut is really short compared to us obviously our stomach kind of hangs off a little bit um to our left but theirs is directly below we just know that the the you know the sphincter at the top the kind of catchment at the top of the um stomach is not that developed yet and sometimes, especially if they're quite windy babies, sometimes even, you know, if they bring up wind, sometimes if there's just a bit of milk on top of it, they do that all the time. Even shifting them the wrong way, especially if you've got good supply. They've got no pop, it's their pop-off valve, basically. So if they've had too much, they'll just give it back to you. Until, so what tends to happen is once they get bigger, stronger, start, you know, just holding themselves better so they've got Im increased musculature. They're sitting, they're just physically upright more. And when you start food, it's just an extra weight. So usually you're riding it out to at least six months and then hopefully you see some improvement after that once food starts being introduced, yeah. How long you got to go? <laughs> to six months? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Yes, yeah, no. So normal, normal, normal. If it's not blood or bile, if it's just milk or semi-digested milk, freaks yeah. someone out, like people out normally. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It's been in there for a while and now they've tossed yeah. it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're nice. Yeah, semi-digested. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. So if growing okay, no. It's just a lot of washing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, 
so I guess con choking is a concern, especially on a little baby. Hopefully by three months she's past that now, as in, you know, she can move her own head to clear. But in the early days when they're not so, you know, strong and mobile, it, it definitely can be a concern that they're, you know, if they're vomity babies, but hopefully at least they have got their head on the side rather than straight on their back. Yeah, but she's past that. <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody who hasn't had babies thinking about anything in particular? No. Oh, no. uh, yeah, rashes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one of those uh, enigmas, isn't it? Um, they, yeah. We get called to rashes a lot, even in the hospital, even in the newborn period. Um, obviously, you, um, you know, now older babies, so early on, you know, that in that newborn period, the most common rash is that I think people refer to as baby acne, but that it, the fancy word is erythema toxicum, where it just almost looks like heat rashy all over their body. So he's obviously past that now, but that is... Um, one of the main things. So any rash, I guess the general rule with any rash is if it looks infected, um, you would see somebody. You know, I guess as they get older, there's people get concerns about potential allergies and are thinking eczema and things like that. Um, that's probably a bit of a different conversation. But generally speaking, um, a blanching rash is pretty normal. Just look for infection, I would say. Obviously, it can be alarming if there's other... But if you were finding a non-blanching rash, because obviously that's where people are thinking um, meningococcal and potentially meningitis, but you'd, you'd be probably seeing other signs and symptoms of him being unwell generally if, you're, if there was a rash of concern. There are also um, rashes that can indicate weird and wonderful things like bleeding disorders and things like that. Um, but, you know, just a general rash-looking thing is potentially heat. Um, I guess it could be um, sensitivities as you're in introducing new solids, you know, new food along the way. But infection would be the thing, I would say. And if it... So anything that we see that's a bit... Because babies are weird, obviously, and every baby's different. And so I always say to people, get a baseline photograph. So if you about size of things as well, because sometimes, you know, there can be a patch. Babies get um, common patches, which kind of look a bit eczema-ish. Um, so just get a baseline photograph and see if it changes. Because, you know, as we know, what's, <laughs> what's um, pertinent and, and happening this week probably is going to be something completely different next week. Is there anything particular you're, what you're thinking? Yeah, and that's probably the case. And obviously in winter, they tend to get a bit drier. Yeah. So if it's kind of dry skin, it's really common to get it on their cheeks. Um, that red kind of even rays looking. Yeah. Coconut oil is the thing that we would always say. So anything natural, even avocado oil, um, anything natural to go in their bath or directly on their skin, it's probably just dry. QV, people rave about QV as well, actually, that QV lotion. Can I confirm, blanching essentially means that you press on it and then you take the finger off and it turns white and then it goes yep. red again. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in regards to the food sensitivities that you mentioned, uh, whether that be through breast milk or at that six month mark, you wouldn't necessarily, just because they've got a rash from it showing they have a sensitivity, you wouldn't necessarily avoid it. Because no. Because keep, keep it away. Yeah. Yeah, generally, because it's, oh, unless it's a repeated thing, it's hard to pin, you know, so, so much is happening in their little lives that it's hard, it would be very hard to pinpoint, you know, something. Yeah, Sometimes, you know, like, oh, they, you know, ate kiwi fruit 10 times in a row and this happened, yes, yeah. but a one off, no. Yeah. So amazing, guys. Oh, thank you so That's all right. much for presenting to us, James. That's all right. What a treat, what a treat, what a treat. Thank you so much.
That's all right. Ta. Thank you. Um, things I have to say to you yes. before I forget. Yes. 